Hello, I'm Annie Larkin, Vice President and Director of Community Engagement of the Ameren Museum. Welcome to The Art of Duane Manuel. Before we begin the program today, I want to acknowledge that Ameren is located in southeastern Arizona on lands where Otham, Hopi, Ashwi, Yoeme, and Apache families have lived for untold generations, and whose wisdom and tradition live on today in vibrant communities. We are grateful for what all these communities, rich in history, have to teach us. Thank you to our program sponsor, sponsor Desert Diamond Casinos, as well as our members and donors who enable Ameren to provide free online programming and to fulfill Ameren's mission to foster and promote the knowledge and understanding of the native peoples of the Americas through research, education, conservation, and community engagement. To learn how you can assist Ameren in supporting its mission by become a, um, becoming a member or donor, please visit Ameren.org. On July 9th at 11 a.m., Ameren will host the free online lecture, Casas Grandes Clothing and Identity with Dr. Christine Van Poole. Please visit the events section of Ameren's Facebook page or website, Ameren.org, for registration details. Then on July 23rd at 11 a.m., Ameren will host the free online lecture, Prehistoric Moche Politics and Food Along Peru's North Coast with Dr. George Wolf Gummerman. Again, please visit the event section of Ameren's Facebook page or website, ameren.org, for registration details. I would now like to introduce our speaker. Dwayne Manuel is from the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community. He graduated from the infamous Desert Eagle Secondary School located in Salt River, Arizona in 2002. Attending Scottsdale Community College briefly after high school, he would then go on to receive his Bachelor of Fine Arts from the prestigious Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe in 2010. Duane then attended the University of Arizona School of Art, where he received a Master of Fine Arts in 2014. Duane currently teaches painting and drawing at the Tana Autumn Community College at the Phoenix and Cells Arizona campuses. In his professional career, Duane has collaborated and been commissioned by organizations such as Nike, Salt River Courts, the New Arizona Prize, the Cheyenne River Youth Project, the Tucson Museum of Art, Mesa Art Center, and the Children's Museum in Tucson. If you would like to ask any questions during the program today, please type your questions in the Q&A chat box, and we'll gather those to share with our speaker after the presentation. Also, a link to, to today's recording uh, will be sent to all of our Zoom registrants later today. And with that, I'd like to welcome you to uh, our program, Duane. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Annie. I appreciate it. Can you hear me? We sure can. Okay, great. So uh, thank you for that introduction. And I'm, I'm glad to be here to work with the Amarind again. So uh, welcome everybody else. Also, thank you all for, for who are watching, tuning in. Uh, welcome, and I hope you enjoy my artist presentation. So I'm going to be begin by sharing my screen and kind of talk to you about how this is going to go. So my screen should be sharing, and I am now pulling up my, my presentation. Let me put my slideshow up. Start slideshow. Okay, so uh, with this presentation, uh, I want to give you uh, an idea of where I've come from at, a, as a, at an early age to where I am now. And it's all through the realm of art and art making. As Annie introduced me, you know, I've, uh, I've traveled my way through academia, at least the art academia, to now being a professor of art at the Thon Autumn Community College. So uh, I'm going to kind of guide you through the uh, eras that I went through with not only my art and also just my life experience, but also what I was thinking at the time and how I went about my creative process. So this presentation is called The Life and Art of Duane Manuel, a survey of painting and drawings from roughly 2005 to 2022. So to begin my artist career, I start with this first slide and if you look on the left, I have a photo of me holding a drawing that I did in 1989. I always joke and tell people that my 
when they, they ask me how long I've been working on art or how long I've been drawing painting, I say, uh, you know, I think I was pretty much born with a pencil in my hand because one of my earliest memories is just drawing, you know, sitting at the uh, sitting at the, the shelf, the window shelf and uh, drawing on a piece of paper with a pencil. So uh, it's, it's one of those things that I've always found myself doing and uh, having the need to do for some reason. And so it was early established when I was younger to uh, just draw. And I do remember having influences from like my my mother, my father, and then also my uncles and aunties who also had some kind of creative juice that they I would see them do here and there. Uh, I had an uncle who would always be drawing as well. So I remember drawing with him. And uh, it's just one of those things that I just, uh, I was kind of grew up around. And although nobody really took it to the next level where, you know, to make it a profession, uh, but everybody did have something they did with their hands when it came to creating. So I think that that was probably one of the, um, my main inspirations when I was younger is just seeing them working with their hands. And especially my mom being a basket maker, uh, you know, those kind of um, traits, I guess, kind of carried on with me as I got older. So in that photo, I'm holding this uh, picture that I drew of my mom in 1989. And I remember drawing this photo, uh, this, this drawing actually uh, back then uh, using markers. And so, uh, uh, you know, my mom dug it out one time. She showed it me, she said, hey, you remember this? And, you know, it says my mom. And then of course there's the, uh, the date there. And I was like, oh yeah, I do remember that, you know? And so uh, looking at it, you know, uh, just using the basics of uh, design elements there, you know, line and dots to create color. So there's a, there's a lot of kind of cool, interesting things happening there when I look back at it nowadays. So just down to the basic fundamentals is pretty much what I like to think about when I look at that picture. And so, uh, you know, moving forward, you know, I was always drawing throughout my adolescence from what I can remember to even a teenager. So uh, on the, on the right-hand side, I have a photo of, of me in my Desert Eagle football team. So Desert Eagle High School was the school that I graduated from. And it's a school that was located on the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community where I'm from. And uh, it was, I like to show this picture because it kind of gives me a glimpse of maybe uh, a path I could have took rather than art because uh, after football, I, I, it was an option to go to school for football. And I remember there was a coach looking at, at me from uh, BYU up there in uh, uh, Utah, I believe, uh, to, go to, to go to college and play uh, college ball. And so, you know, I, I, I think about that often, but uh, it was something I didn't really want to pursue because I wasn't passionate about it. So I think if you pursue a passion, it, I think there could be some you never know where you're going to get. You never know where you're going to go. And so, you know, with, with my art, you know, I, I never thought it would take me to where I've been. And so uh, I like to use this picture just to kind of show, remind myself really of, uh, you know, where I've been, you know, uh, at a young age, having to make those decisions on what I was going to do next after high school. Because everybody, you know, has that, has that, um, that moment where we have to kind of decide what's next in life, correct? And so that, that, this picture kind of, reminds me of the time where I had to decide what I was going to do next because I knew I had to do something after high school uh, uh, rather than stay on the reservation. Uh, you know, I knew, I always knew that I had something that I needed to do out of high school and that I didn't want to stay on the reservation and not do nothing. You know, I needed to do something. So uh, that's why I use this picture here. And all at the same time, you know, I was still drawing and doing stuff when it came to this era of my life uh, in high school uh, when I was coming to that transition of the next part of my life, you know, uh, essentially becoming a, a young man after after high school and football. So uh, where I'm from, I come from the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community. And for those of you who don't know, uh, Salt River is tucked right between the Phoenix metropolitan area, the Scottsdale area, Tempe, and uh, Mesa. And to give you a, an idea of how it looks, uh, on the right-hand side there, I have a photo of the northern border of the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community and the northern uh, and North Scottsdale. So as you can see, the city of Scottsdale presses right up against my tribal borderlands. And so uh, when I think about it, you know, a, a lot of my artwork comes from that experience of living on the reservation, but then also going into the uh, the getting those experiences from the city life as well. So how they kind of merge and how they uh, not only conflict, but also how they, um, yeah, merge, you know, they kind of blend together. So it's, um, it's an interesting area that I live in 
and it does play a lot in my artwork when it, when I fully analyze what I do. So that's the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian Community, and we just recently uh, celebrated our um, anniversary of when the uh, the reservation was established. So I am a Ankh Akhmet Atham. That means the Salt River people. And I'm uh, related to the Akhmet Atham, which are the Gila River people. Uh, pretty much the same people. Uh, but, you know, uh, those talking about reservation borders, you know, when the city came and kind of separated us, we, uh, you know, we were, our, that's where we kind of landed. And so, like, for in our case, the Gila River and the Salt River people, you know, the cities of uh, Mesa, Chandler, and all those areas kind of um, separated us and that's where we kind of are today. So uh, again, my artwork has to do a lot about who I am and my people and where I'm from. So this is just a slide to kind of introduce you if you don't know who the Alchemist Autumn are. And uh, you know, we, we are currently still on our ancestral lands here in the, not only the uh, Phoenix area, but also uh, the Thorn Autumn down in uh, Tucson in uh, Mexico, which is all our ancestral areas. So we are still there and we are still living on these areas. Of course, we are now in reservations, but uh, we are still here. So this, I like to use this image just to kind of introduce you to the people and where I'm from. And uh, we are known for our baskets, as you can see on the right-hand side. And also in the, in the first image too, as well, where we have a woman making her baskets outside of her uh, oldest key, which is a traditional house. And so talking about baskets, uh, another big aspect of my art is using these uh, these traditional designs in my artwork. So I take a lot, a lot of my artwork derives from the you know, Otham basket designs and uh, hula gum pottery and things like that. So, you know, I just like to show this slide as well to show you, introduce you to kind of give you an idea of where I pull these designs from. Because a lot of these designs are very ancient. And, you know, uh, the way I use them is to uh, kind of... Uh, make them more contemporary. And you'll see that more as I uh, go throughout my presentation. So outside of high school, you know, like I, I kind of talked about that already, how uh, when high school I had to make that decision what to do. And so uh, luckily I started taking bridge classes out of high school from a, a college called the Scottsdale Community College, which is actually located on my reservation. And so being there, I, I got to introduce, I got introduced to kind of these early uh, fundamental classes of uh, drawing and uh, design. So it was there is where I kind of started putting my foot into the uh, academic world of the, uh, you know, the art game. And so being at that, being there at SCC, uh, I, I, I had to, again, I didn't like taking the, you know, our, uh, the basic class reading, writing, math and stuff. So uh, I, I started to learn more about uh, the college, the college life and what I needed to do to get to obtain a degree. And at the time I wasn't really too, wasn't really too interested in getting a, a bachelor's. I was kind of just like, okay, let me get a, let me get an associate's degree and see what happens. But, um, you know, it wasn't until I applied for the Institute of American Indian Arts, where I kind of learned that you'll need a bachelor's degree to to push you even further so uh, when I got there I, I went there for an associate's degree but it um you know I, I I realized that you know that wasn't enough and so a bachelor's degree would be the degree I, I was going for at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe New Mexico so I, I applied for their four degree four-year program which was the bachelor's degree but it took me about five years to get it because, you know, life stuff happens, you know, you mess around, you don't, you don't get things done. And uh, I had to take a year off because I was having too much fun. And so uh, it took me five years to get my bachelor's degree at the Institute of American Indian Arts. But at the um, Institute of American Indian Arts is where I kind of established myself as um, an artist who didn't really want to do the stereotypical uh, cliche approach to uh, art making, at least in a, a Native American context, because uh, when I went there, I felt that the uh, majority of students were doing primarily the, uh, you know, the, the, the Native American art of uh, feathers, horses, uh, things like that, you know, those kind of those cliche Western images of Native Americans. And so I already knew that that wasn't something I wanted to pursue. So uh, in this slide, as you can see, a lot of my work was kind of something similar to this, uh, uh, very dark, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of movement, a lot of very expressive brush strokes, but still painting a, a picture of something. And what I found myself doing at IEIA was 
kind of expressing my um my issues that I had, you know, with growing up or with uh, life on the reservation and uh, these different um, problems I had growing up. So with uh, my work at the time, I was really getting a lot of this negative stuff out of out onto the canvas. And it was, but it was stuff I enjoyed painting, you know, because I already kind of leaned more into the, uh, the kind of darker imagery, uh, even as a young child or even as a uh, adolescent, you know, growing up, I was always into skulls. I was always into snakes, knives and things like that. So I would draw those things and those just the stuff I was really into. But, uh, you know, being at IIA, I, I did kind of find myself kind of asking the question is why am I drawing this stuff? And if I do draw it, then, then, maybe drawing or painting with more of a purpose is what I found myself doing at IAIA. And so, you know, with these kind of images and the stuff I was doing, uh, very expressive. And uh, like, again, a, a lot has to do with my childhood and my experiences. But uh, I think at that time, you know, I was really just kind of maturing and letting things out because when I let things out, you know, it, it leaves more room for other things to come in and to, and to, and to paint about. So at IAIA, I was doing this kind of work here and, um, I was doing a lot of painting back then, and it, it 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 probably was more for maybe therapy or you know the stuff to kind of like clear my conscience. But uh, this is the kind of stuff I was doing back then at the Institute of American Indian Arts, and it wasn't your you know standard issue Native American arts. You know, there's no feathers and no horses, there's no chiefs and things like that. But they are definitely rooted in my experience as a Native American person growing up on the reservation, and so. At the Institute of American Indian Arts, I also found that I didn't have to just paint because I went in there for the uh, 2D program, right, painting, and uh, no one was doing paint. They kind of pressed, they kind of pressed, I mean, no one was doing drawing as a, a more finer art, you know, because drawing is primarily a um, preliminary skill, right, a draftsmanship. You you use it to to sketch, to sketch out ideas, and then, then, you finalize it by doing a painting or, or a print or what have you. So uh, at instant, at the IIA, I did kind of think about, well, why, why do I have to just paint? Can I explore drawing a little bit more? Can I fine tune my drawing skills a little bit more? And so outside of my artwork that I was doing for classes, like, you know, I was still doing the, uh, the painting projects and painting assignments and things like that. But I made time to draw on the side of stuff that I wanted to do and stuff that I was interested in and still kind of exploring that darker side of uh, my mind, I guess you would call it. And so I was doing all these, these charcoal drawings when I, was, when I wasn't doing my, uh, my classwork. And so a lot of the stuff that was coming out at that time in this era were these really elaborate drawings of just kind of randomness at times. And there are areas that do have some uh, metaphor here and there, but um, it was just kind of get again, getting things out and, uh, and mainly, I was a. Uh, I kind of found that love for drawing again. You know, as as a young kid, I always thought, I always found myself just kind of drawing, zoning out, and not really caring about what I was drawing or um, not trying to make really a statement. But I was just drawing to draw, and so I found myself doing that again with these charcoal drawings. Even though there are metaphor and there are statements in there, but there still was kind of that that zoning out that I, that would happen when I would do these. Um, these charcoal drawings and and they are they're, they're not too big they're probably about um i don't know 12 by 20 inches some of them maybe 22 by 30 i think but uh they're all charcoal and so uh one thing i did want to do is I, I did push myself to not only use graphite as a, as my media because that's what i was used to you know we're all kind of used to using uh, drawing pencils when we we learn how to draw but I wanted to start pushing uh, charcoal and seeing what I can do with charcoal. And so that's where these drawings came from. And so this is my side work that I was doing, but it did, these, these drawings did mean a lot to me. And I, I did, I, I did a lot of these uh, charcoal drawings. Some I still have and some I uh, gave away, some so, sold, but uh, I, I can say that I did found, find my love for drawing again when I was there at the Institute of American Indian Arts, because for a while there, I wasn't really drawing too much and I was primarily, uh, Kind of focused as being a painter, which, as you can see in these uh, these early works of uh, that kind of real painterly style, where I was loose, I made sure the brush strokes were there, I made sure it was expressive, but at the same time pushing paint around and seeing what they do when they blend. So uh, that's that's my uh, my kind of uh, the, the the process that I went through at the IAIA, and then uh, but I did when it comes to the bachelor's degree, you have to have a 
a, a senior thesis show. And so for my thesis show, I wanted to explore charcoal in a, in a kind of larger format. So I did these lar larger scale drawings, these charcoal drawings at IIA just to push myself a little further. And the, so those work, the work that I was doing on the side, those, uh, those side drawings, and then I decided to use that and push it in my, uh, my thesis show because I was more excited about those drawings rather than just painting. And so that, that's, where, that's where my uh, thesis show came called When It Rains, It's Worms. It was, so it's pretty much the same concept about just drawing and spacing out and you know, just kind of seeing where, where the drawing went to and not really focused too much on the, the statements. What my statement was, you know, that drawing can be larger than just a preliminary skill. And so that's where these drawings came from. And so I have a, a photo here on the left, the left corner of a, a process drawing of how I started the, uh, the, this area. You know, this starts off with a, a graphite sketch and I, I j start to add in value as I move forward. And then the bottom, I have a photo of me standing next to two complete pieces of these drawings that I just finished, just to kind of show you the scale of the work. So after IEIA, you know, I graduated with my bachelor's degree and, you know, I had this, I had all this work and I had all this, uh, what I would think, uh, I had all these skills that I gained at the Institute of American Indian Arts. And then now it was time to, uh, you know, go back in, out into the big world and see what I can do. And so I found myself getting a job. I moved back home after Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I got a job at a gas station. And I was working uh, 6 p.m. to, or 6, yeah, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., uh, the night shift, a uh, security guard. And so I was working nights and uh, sleeping all day and, and, and then, you know, repeat. So that's pretty much uh, what happened after I, I, and there wasn't really no, I really didn't know what to do about uh, what, what I could use my degree on. And everyone was saying, yeah, you can teach, you can teach now. But then when you look into teaching, you know, at a, at a college level, at least you'll have to have a master's degree on up. And so I only had a bachelor's. And I remember going into some galleries and kind of seeing what was up. And the galleries didn't really seem like a fit for me and they didn't really seem interested. So I was like, okay, what's next? I'll, I'm going to keep working and I'll, I'll, I'll keep doing some work. So uh, as I kept working, working at this gas station, you know, making a little bit of money. I found myself not being able to create because of the routine of sleeping all day and then working all night and not really having no time to, to draw or make some work. Uh, it was really starting to take its toll on me. And uh, uh, like I was saying in the beginning, when as a young, a young kid, you know, as a kid, I, 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 had, I had this need to draw and it, it's always been there. So I think after I graduated AIA, it felt like uh, depression started coming in because I wasn't being able to do what I've always been able to do throughout my life. And that probably has to do with a lot of different things when it comes to my practice at, uh, you know, being in academia and in the artwork and then, you know, being and working and not in the class where you have to work because, you know, you're trying to get a grade, of course, but then, you know, you're, when you're let off the leash, I guess you would say, and you're trying to, you know, make your own work and you don't have like, um, you don't have a, a direction to go towards, it, uh, it really kind of took its toll on me because, uh, after IEIA, you know, I had that, like I said, I, had, I found that love for drawing again, but then, you know, I was, I was a student, so I had plenty of time to do my drawing and also do classwork, but then now being in the real world and working and, you know, try, having to try to make that time, it was, real, it was really difficult for me to, to uh, be inspired and to get motivated. So what I would do is uh, when I had free time, you know, my days off, I would sit there and try to think of something to draw, something to, what, what do I want to draw about? What do I want to paint about? And then, you know, nothing come up. I had a, a, blo a block, an artist block, if you will. And so what, what I did was I found that, you know, I reached out to other artists and it, it's, a, it's a problem. If you talk to other artists about how do you, the, the, the major question is, you know, how do you get over artist block? If you, that's one thing I think as an artist, a lot of people ask, how, how do you get over that? And so um, I found that it's just working. It just, you know, it doesn't ha doesn't matter what it is, what, what you're drawing or painting, as long as you're drawing something and you kind of keep, you start that momentum again and kind of keep it moving. You know, the, this, the first drawing that you do in an artist block, maybe it's not 
something you wanted to do or maybe it's not exciting to you but the, i guarantee you the more you do it the more you'll start to find uh your voice again and you'll find a purpose again and then you kind of catch this wave and that's this way I, that it happens to me and so for these watercolor mixed media exercises that i have here on this slide this this is the result of kind of going through that process and I also recommend experimentation when it comes to those artist blocks. You know, if you're having an artist block, I definitely recommend that you do try something new or try something different to kind of maybe get you more excited or get you out of that, that little funk. And so with these watercolor mixed media exercises I did was I, I would get, I, I got some watercolor paper and I had watercolors, I just never used them. And I was like, hey, maybe I'll, maybe I'll do something with these watercolors. And so what I did is, you know, I'd, um, I wet the paper here and there in different areas, and I would just splash watercolor onto the paper. And yeah, if you know what, if any of you know how to play with watercolor, you know that when you drop that water on a soaked paper, it's kind of fun to watch that water expand throughout the paper, and it's really kind of psychedelic. So I'll be doing that just to kind of zone out again, kind of look at and see what's going on. And then when I was doing that, I was like, hey, this kind of looks like something, this shape. So I actually, I would do like maybe three, four, just watercolor drip paint paintings and I'll let it dry and then I'll come back to it and say, like, hey, this this shape kind of looks like something. So that's very similar to that um the the you know the Ross the what do you call it? How do you say it? the uh, the Ross check test or something, you know, the ink blot test where does the 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 therapist would do some ink blocks on the paper and then you look at it and make shapes out of it. I'll be very similar. And that's what I would do. I would drop the watercolor onto the paint. I would soak the watercolor paper, drop different colors here and there, make splatters here and there, and then put it to the side, come back and make things, make shapes out of whatever the, the shapes came. And so that's how all these uh, mixed media drawings came to be. They were all started like that. So every, every uh, weird animal, every face, everything on there is was created by just dropping uh, paint onto the paper and then creating something out of it. And um, so this kind of got my uh, creative juices going when I was going through this uh, artist funk. And uh, it, and it really, it helped me a lot because I, I learned more about, uh, you know, this diff experimental process, but then also it kind of gave me ideas to, to move forward with uh, when it came to this part of, to part of my life outside of getting my bachelor's degree. So, you know, I always recommend students to, uh, to, to, experiment you know try different things out because you never know what's going to take you so I, I which is really cool i got a lot of good feedback from these these weird watercolor drawings and i've actually i i did actually get rid of majority of them of selling them but i do have a couple left that i kind of hold on to just to for safekeeping because i really like it it also reminds me of a time in my life where i was going through uh you know that artist funk which is what something we all kind of go through uh, if you're an artist or any, anything, you know, you, we always kind of go through these funks or maybe we don't want to do anything or stuff in our life is kind of taking a toll and we're not really focused. We're, we're focused too much on maybe the negative aspect and, you know, we're not focused on being productive. And so uh, I, these watercolor mixed media exercises really help me move things along. And so, uh, you know, at this era, again, working a uh, full-time job, night shift, and then, you know, finding time, making time, to be creative, I finally decided to tell myself, hey, maybe, you know, maybe at that, at that point, uh, maybe a master's degree doesn't, won't be that bad, right? Kind of, you know, the grass is greener, right? Looking on, maybe a master's degree is the way to go. So uh, I ended up quitting this job at the, at the convenience store and uh, I started, I apl applied for uh, the master's program at both U of A and ASU. And I, I got, ended up getting into both programs, their master's programs, but I decided that the University of Arizona School of Art was the way to go. And so, you know, getting in there, I was like, okay, th here's the next step. And so I was always told by my, um, my undergraduate professors that, you know, as an undergraduate, getting your bachelor's, it's kind of like you're running. You're running and you're feeling good. You know, you have all these skills, you're, you're a rock star pretty much. But when you get into a master's program, especially an art one, uh, they warned me that, you know, uh, it's going to be a little tougher, I guess, depending on where you go. But, uh, you know, because, you know, when you come out of your bachelor's degree, you're running, you're a rock star, you're running. And then, but when you come to your master's program, their job, the, the instructors or the professors, their job is to push you while you're running and see what you do. And so that's what I felt like. And they were correct. 
you know, I, I was running out. I, I was running into the, the master's program, feeling like a star. But then, you know, getting in there, that's when uh, stuff got a little get, stuff, stuff started getting a little tougher and they would push me. They pushed me a lot. So, I, you know, I was uh, falling down and I was but you're getting back up. I don't know how many times in my master's program where I felt like quitting. Uh, there's there's many times where I didn't want to keep going. I was like, is this something I really want to put myself through? And it's pretty much just um, psych, psych, psychological on yourself. You're you're challenging yourself, really. And especially if you if you really want to get something out of your programs that you go for, you know, you would put some trust in your professors and and you know and really make push yourself and challenge yourself to do uh, not only what they're asking but uh, what they're recommending, really. So at the U of A, uh, I went in there kind of doing the, like, you know, this stuff, doing these experimental drawings, trying to do them a little more. And, uh, you know, they, they, they would, uh, my critiques, they would always be bad, or in my opinion, they'd be bad because none of my professors liked what I was doing. They were challenging me, really. They were challenging me to start thinking about what I was doing and why I was making the art. That's just, you know, that's just their job to be, to be tougher on the, on the, uh, the, these uh, these graduate students are coming in for the masters, and so uh, you know I I do remember that one of my critiques, uh, one of my instructors did tell me, uh, asked me why I was making this darker work, what was the purpose, what was the reason, and you know I didn't really have too much answers for him, so he told me, hey, look at some real work, look at some real work by artists who have seen war, who have seen death, have seen this like that, and then he said, ask yourself, what have you seen? What, what, what frightens you, I, then, then then I'll have some more answers about what kind of work I was making and why I was making the work. And so, you know, I took that with me and I said, okay, I'm, I'm gonna do that, you know? That, so it took me some pondering on what I was, why I was making work and what I was doing. And so I, I started to ask myself, well, what, what scares, what am I scared of? What, what, what's, what am I angry about? Th th that's the main question. And so I started thinking about who I was again and where I come from. And what scared me and what frightened me, not only as a youngin, but also as a, as an adult. And so I started to think, and and so I couldn't really find much answers. I had to go back to the you know who I was from, the roots of where I was from, and I was Otham. I was a, so specifically a Salt River Otham, but there are a lot of issues about where I'm from, and also not only where I'm from, but also Native American people in general. And so my biggest concern or my biggest fear or uh, what made me angry was uh, diabetes. You know, I, I remember growing up seeing my uh, grandmother who was an uh, amputee to, due to diabetes, you know, uh, seeing her legs uh, like chopped off, seeing, you know, these uh, people with no limbs around the reservation, uh, uh, seeing the, these, uh, these men who, uh, as a young kid, who were, you know, I thought were always, I knew we're always big and strong men, right? You know, tough, tough guys. And then you see them now, or I, I will see them again later on in life. And, you know, they, they, they pretty much, you know, uh, shriveled into a, a di diabe the diabetes sickness. And, you know, they had no, no arms, no fingers, no legs, no feet. You know, so I, I started thinking of this idea of my people being chopped up and, you know, what, what, why and what plays into that. And, and so anyways, that went, that, that took me onto a, a path of, analyzing the history of my people and why we are so prone to uh, the diabetes sickness. And so with that, with that research I was doing, because U of A is a uh, research one uh, university, you know, the, the, they also pushed me to uh, research, to look at things, to use the library, use uh, the special collections, and, you know, to help me answer these questions. And so my research went into the, 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 the rivers of my people and where I come from. But before I get into that, uh, real quick, I'm going to talk about this slide here because uh, the, these images are also products from that research, but uh, they're kind of the, the the process of what I went through when I was at the U, U of A. And so what we have here are pretty much uh, these characters. And these characters, at least the design work, they do have different influences from different artists and also uh, influences from graffiti art, which is something I was always into since the late 90s. But uh, I'll talk more about that uh, later. So uh, this first uh, image on the left, we have a character I created called Beer Can Sam. And so Beer Can Sam is a, uh, he, he's kind of a, uh, a reference to these uh, old rocker guys I, I knew growing up that were like a, a reminiscent of my, either my uncles or my uh, my dad's friends. 
And so, you know, I, I kind of have this image of how they look when they come around, they party, you know, drink and things like that. So that, that's what this uh, character kind of represents. It's kind of that, uh, that old school rocker guy, but also the guy who likes to party. And so, you know, but it's kind of, that, that kind of goes into the, the alcohol, alcoholism, right? And so he, he's there, he has beer cans kind of shoved in his eye and he, uh, he, he vomited all over himself. And he's uh, balancing that forty-ounce bottle in, in his in his hand, and then also in the background uh, to kind of keep that um, that more indigenous feel. That I kept, I keep those designs. I wanted to keep that as a backdrop to kind of just to kind of reference that you know this is specific to Native America and more specific to uh, the autumn experience. And then we move to the right where we have uh, what, who I like to call the popover queen. And the popover queen is just a, a, a popover is a, a fry bread. If you don't know what a popover is, a fry bread, uh, we all, we might, you might be all familiar with the Native American fry bread from, uh, you know, you go to the fairs or you go to uh, any kind of our market and things like that, or just, you know, we all, I think everybody pretty much knows what a fry bread is. So we have the popover queen right here. We call it popover here in um, the uh, Autumn Territory. And so she's, uh, as you can see, she has a sash, she has a crown on, and she has, she has a, a, a Indian taco in her hand. And she's kind of, she took a piece of her face and she's kind of eating it at the same time. So these these characters also play on the garbage pail, uh, garbage pail kids. If you remember those cards growing up, which is something I was always interested in growing up is seeing these cards and kind of like, wow, not only just the, the kind of the gross stuff that's going on in them, but also just the artwork. When I see those cool illustrations, I always thought they were really uh, nicely well done. So this is kind of maybe an ode to that to that era, and also kind of what I'll, what interests me. And then again, having the uh, the basket design in the back to keep it to solidify that this is uh, regarding more specific to uh, you know the ind indigenous people. And then to the far right, we have a character I created called Toby, and Toby also speaks to the uh, the diabetes. Uh, illness, the problem in Native America. And so Toby, as you can tell, is a baby. And he uh, has his diaper on, he's holding a Coke. And, uh, he, but he, there is one problem with Toby is that he does have uh, a couple limbs missing, at least a hand, and I believe some toes, and maybe a finger. So that kind of just, uh, as, as a, we, we talk about in my family, uh, you know, we, I remember my mom saying one point in my life, this is younger, that, you know, she's starting to see more young folks getting diabetes and it kind of getting more worse and actually a lot, as you as i got older a lot of the younger folk were passing away from diabetes and so that, that's kind of this this lithograph which is a lithograph by the way is a uh, is a reference to that and so again i had to kind of keep uh the indigenous um aesthetic in there so he's standing on this uh this uh, basket design as well so that's Toby. And I made a couple of renditions of him, actually. And uh, I primarily used him on uh, lithograph prints. So to kind of close up my University of Arizona stay, uh, I, I had to do a uh, thesis show as well. And so my the thesis show for my master's degree was uh, an uh, a culmination of all the research I did. And so I did these four large paintings that were supposed to uh, mimic a mural, but you know, so I couldn't paint at, on the wall and I, I didn't want to save these uh, paintings. I did them on these large canvases. And so th th this series is called The Man in the Maze. And they, it's pretty much all my research put into one uh, large piece. And so uh, starting from the center image of all four canvases, uh, the, it's supposed to be read from right to left as opposed to left to right. And so uh, uh, I wish I had some more detailed images of the, the piece, but um, I do have a, to shoot on over to this left-hand corner of the, uh, this drawing, which is one of the preliminary drawings I did before doing the, um, the actual canvas work is a, a character, another character I made up called, um, I believe that's P Pima Ben. And Pima Ben is a, uh, is a, uh, a man, as you can tell, who is shoveling uh, pretty much this vomit that's coming out of his mouth. He's kind of regurgitating all this stuff that's going into him. And uh, that, that stuff that he's regurgitating is all kind of these introduced uh, elements once, um, you know, once we were uh, colonized and we got uh, the, the, once the rivers were blocked from the uh, government, 
and we were introduced but to uh these uh these new foods and these new almost these new issues coming in he's he's kind of shoveling he's trying to shovel out all this all this new stuff that's not really agreeing with him that's why he's he's regurgitating all this stuff and he's trying to get it out but um, at the same time he he's not really going anywhere because he's he's stuck in this river of uh vomit and he, he's kind of stuck in there and you, you could see it better in the uh, actual painting rather than the preliminary the preliminary sketch but uh, so there's a lot of kind of political stuff going on in these images and to shoot over to the far right i have a close-up detail shot of um this uh baby who's um standing there with his 40 ounce bottle and the nipple so uh, again kind of still talking about that that uh, addiction and kind of that early early addiction that that starts to happen on, on the reservation for some people so uh, i'm talking about you know the alcoholism so I, I you know you do see a lot of younger folks kind of getting drinking more and more uh, at, at a younger age but then also uh the the uh the gangster lifestyle right that's happening there too he has his lokes on he has one button up and then he has his uh he, he has his uh his heater tucked into his his diaper but then again he, uh, we talk about the violence and there's you know he's shot in the head he has a hole in his head he also has a, a hole in his chest and so, uh, you know, those, those influences from outside that came into the reservation, those kind of all play into, um, more, maybe more specific to where I'm from, but I think a lot of reservations do have the same issue. So that, that, that kind of plays into all of that. And like I said, you know, being my, in my location in Saw River, that, you know, the, the, I do throw a lot of this stuff into my artwork because I do see it a lot. And it's a lot of stuff I did see it while growing up. And so, uh, but it all kind of plays into our location and also the introduction of uh, the city around us. So uh, U of A, that was pretty much my stay at U of A. You know, I, I, I learned a lot from U of A. I challenged myself at U of A. And uh, I, not only did I learn a lot about uh, art making, but I also learned a lot about myself. And I learned a lot about my people because I researched and I looked at my people. And, um, you know, I tried to... Uh, think I try to think outside of myself and kind of go about it in a way that I, I didn't take it too personal. But you know, it, it got personal to me because you know, of course, uh, seeing all this this uh, horrible stuff that happened to my people, it really uh, took a toll on me. I do remember reading, reading, researching, and uh, almost being pretty much being brought to tears by all these articles. You know about the uh, you know the way my people were treated back then. And to this day, still kind of gets me a little choked up. So. Moving forward, you know, uh, during U of A and at IEIA, uh, like I said, I was doing work on the side. And one thing I didn't talk about yet is I started to play around with uh, the basket designs, my people's basket designs. And one thing I forgot to mention at IEIA, or I did mention it, that I didn't want to do the uh, the uh, the kind of the Native American route, the, at least the cliche Native American route. So there was always this uh, question in the back of my mind is how do I take a fresher look or how do I do take a fresher um, approach at making artwork that is, I guess, more Native American, I guess you would say, or at least more cultural specific. And so uh, I started playing around with uh, my people's basket designs. And like I said, my mother, I always, I always seen the basket designs growing up because my mother was a basket maker. And I always thought they were beautiful. I always thought they were amazing. I always thought they looked good at test tattoos. I always thought they, just, they were just uh, beautiful beautiful design work and um it just, it just blew my mind of you know how they were made back then and still to this day they still blow my mind how they you know they they made these design work and so uh as an artist i had to think about how can i re how can i take a look at these designs remake them but then put a, a fresh twist on them make them more contemporary and so the result is i have two examples here on the side of what one is a charcoal drawing up top and then the second is a mixed media painting on the bottom and so kind of talking about that I started to kind of think about how I would do that and so the result is mixing those uh those traditional designs with the environment around me and out you know the the urban sprawl that that really played a toll on what I would do with these basket designs and these are just a couple of images I use for reference to kind of give you an idea of what I was thinking and how I would mix them into the basket design so the result is uh, items like this. So as you can see, these charcoal basket designs, which are pretty much the first designs I started doing were just charcoal. 
And they, 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 these were the ones that I kind of came up with first. And, uh, you know, the result is uh, these really abstract basket designs pushed even further, you know, using a lot of geometric shape. And they would eventually start to uh, make their way into paintings. And as you can see here, I have uh, from left to right, these are kind of a, uh, these almost like little stages that the, the, uh, these basket designs went through. So the first one is the, the charcoal drawing up top where I first started. And if you drop down to the left, these kind of more finer, cleaner lines uh, with the basket design, and then they get more expressive as you move to the right. And so what the, what the basket designs, kind of playing around with these basket designs, what they taught me is how to experiment again and also how to use these more abstract expressionist painting marks to uh, you know, make these more interesting paintings. And so it also taught me a lot more about process and how to layer and things like that. So, you know, I would start a basket design and I will let it dry, come back to it a day or two later and then start adding more work. And it allowed me to work on three, four, five basket paintings at once. So it's actually been a really fun process do, using the basket design to make these abstract expressionistic works. So with the, I see that I'm running out of I'm a little time. Okay. So I think that when it comes to my artwork, I, I really started to push myself to think about how I can merge or how can I make these uh, basket designs, push them further. That's the thing. How, how can I push them a little bit further? Because I'm always trying to think about what I'm going to do to push myself and my artwork a little further. So a uh, side note, like I said, I was in, into graffiti uh, probably since 1998 when I first started seeing graffiti and started getting into it. And then, you know, uh, kind of keep it going throughout the years on and off. Uh, I found myself, you know, getting more into it in my in my twenties. Uh, the the whole artwork of graffiti and the 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 colors and the structures uh, were really something I was interested in and really something I loved to do. So that merger of graffiti and murals is what brought me to the uh, the basket design. So uh, you know, the graffiti plus the basket designs equals these larger these larger murals. And so that's kind of how I, I wanted to do was push it. How can I push these basket designs further? Because they already started getting bigger on canvas. So how would I make them bigger, bigger than that? And so I could just paint one on an entire wall. So, you know, with graffiti, you paint, you paint large, you paint fast. And so I started to bring those graffiti aesthetics and also graffiti techniques into painting these basket murals. And so luckily I had some friends who had walls Hey, paint my wall. You know, I had an idea. So yeah, let me paint a basket design on your wall. And so they, they would let me. And so, you know, I, I wanted to get my portfolio up when it came to these basket designs. And so that's how, how I started, you know, merging the two, uh, you know, just painting large basket designs on walls and then using graffiti techniques and graffiti, um, you know, um, aesthetics to get these really large, interesting paintings. And so uh, the one on the left is a one of my earlier designs painted in my buddy's game room. As you can see, his pool table there, and the one on the on uh, the right is a collaboration I did with a release from uh, an artist from Albuquerque, New Mexico, for the Paint Phoenix Jam in 2016. And luckily, uh, the these designs and my mural work kind of got got my name out there, and I got to go paint them in different locations. So, for instance, uh, the top left hand corner is in Eagle Butte, South Dakota, for the Red Can Jam. The one on the right is at the Institute of American Indian Arts. It was a real pleasure to go back to IIA and, and, and leave my mural on one of the walls there. And the one on the bottom left-hand corner was painted for a gallery exhibition in uh, Colorado, at Colorado College. And the one on the far right is a, a piece I did in uh, Los Angeles, California. Okay, so uh, outside of the, uh, the kind of the more spray paint murals, the, the more basket design work, I started uh, doing the acrylic murals. And the reason why I, I, I always kind of lean more towards uh, aerosol paint, spray paint on a wall, just because uh, the, it's faster and it's a lot easier for me to manipulate the paint. But, um, you know, once I started getting other jobs when it comes to the uh, murals, uh, I wasn't always able to use spray paint in indoors or a more of uh, business area. Is, so I had to resort back to my, uh, my, my knowledge of acrylic paint. And so that's where the uh, more brush, the traditional brush, brush and paint a mural started to happen is kind of uh, getting you know, those jobs, getting those, uh, those paint, those mural commissions to do indoor murals 
that you know you could have used spray paint on and so a lot of i did a lot of murals that were uh primarily brush and paint i do prefer aerosol but there there are some tiny details fine details that you can do with acrylic paint that you can't do with aerosol just like with any other media you know you can do you can push one a little further or one you know it's just kind of back and forth but with the acrylic paint it does take longer but uh, the the payoff actually is it rather nice so for instance, this image I have here is the uh, indigenous lady justice that I did in the Saw River of uh, courts. And so this is probably the longest mural I've done and it's all acrylic paint and brush. And it took me about a year and a half, I think. And a uh, funny story is I did, uh, I did injure my foot from being on the ladder so much during, during this painting where I had to take at least a couple of weeks off to finish the painting. But um, this painting did take a, a rather long time. And just to kind of show you some process shots of the painting from top left to right, uh, you can see I started off with just a pencil sketch and moved my way forward where I started filling in the background first because I do like to paint uh, back to front and then uh, eventually moved my way towards, you know, completing the final design there at the bottom right. And so, uh, you know, the idea was just since this mural was in the court system was to have a, a, an autumn feel to it. And then what better way, because we already have the Lady Justice, what better way to turn her into an autumn woman and kind of have more of these uh, more autumn centric uh, items. Like for instance, her scales are, basket, are baskets and she's uh, of course dressed in, um, you know, an autumn attire, which is just a, a white dress uh, and some beads. And also I had a lot of fun with the background and, and kind of playing with light because one thing I do like to do is uh, put, to push myself is to think about my light source. And so I felt the light source coming from directly behind her will give me an idea to kind of, give, or challenge me to play with shadow and light like that and how light would land on other objects. Like for instance, the sorrel cactus and also the clouds there. And by the way, those clouds were probably the most painstaking part of the mural. Uh, so currently I still do draw. And these are just a couple of images of drawings that I've done that are graphite that uh, at least uh, I had time to let myself do. And so for the left side, we have the uh, picture of Coyote with Trump on his head. This one actually went viral once I showed it. And I, I didn't show it right off the bat. I, I drew it once and I, I put it away. I do put drawings away that I don't intend to share, but sometimes I'll, I'll bring it out later and look at it with fresh eyes and maybe say, hey, maybe this drawing is something I wanna share with people. And so that's what happened with the coyote and the Trump headdress is, uh, you know, I just brought it out. Actually, I, I brought it out after he said something dumb on, on, on TV or something. And then I shared it, but then it went, people went wild over it. Uh, and then on the right hand side, uh, I have this photo of this um, Optum man, elder man, and he's sitting on the city of Phoenix. Because I do like to um, remind people that, especially people living in the valley, that the city of Phoenix is Optum land. And so, you know, we, we are from here and so we are still here and we are you know still living and working in the city and also on the reservation but this just this image kind of shows you it's like oh, the man resting he has his uh, war shield he's smoking a cigarette he has a calendar stick he has his hair in traditional uh, dreads and he's just chilling on the city you know what i mean so that's kind of uh, my my idea or uh, not my idea but something i always try to i stress is that you know we're still in autumn land especially in the phoenix area or well, even in tucson area so uh, nowadays I am still doing artwork, but uh, I've leaned into the digital realm. Uh, you know, I was one at, at an early age to think about more of a, to be more about a traditional painting, meaning more about just, you know, uh, handheld paints, you know, stuff, physical paints and drawing. But it wasn't until I, I, I dipped my hand in digital painting, digital art making where I, I really just got sucked in. And so uh, I used the iPad and the Apple Pencil to create these artworks. And they've just been, um, it's been a blast learning this whole media. And so, uh, you know, the result is uh, these, these more clean, real solid digital design work here. And, uh, you know, it's something I still enjoy doing. And it's um, something I've actually, I took off doing, and I still love doing it. And it's, um, it's kind of taken me away from the physical painting of, you know, painting and drawing, but, you know, it, it's still, um, still a lot of uses for digital painting. And it's something that um, I'm still gonna continue to pursue, but it's uh, just been, it just blew my mind. Uh, if you haven't tried digital painting, if you've just been all about traditional work, I do recommend you try it because it's, you're, you're probably gonna get sucked in and, uh, you're not going to know what to do with your life afterwards. Okay, so uh, again, with the digital, I started uh, experimenting in 
what, what digital has allowed me to do is allowed me to experiment with the ideas that uh, real quickly, you know, I, di I didn't have to set up drawings. I didn't have to do a bunch of different preliminary sketches. Digital was so easy and fast. I got to, it, it allows me to pump out ideas even faster. And so I've always had this uh, idea called American possession of uh, kind of uh, merging my love for horror films with uh, the indigenous experience or the Native American experience. And so the result is the, the, the series that I've done called The American Position, where uh, I look more at uh, the, you know, the United States colonial uh, experience as the, uh, as the uh, I guess you would say the, um, the possession, right? The, the devil, the demon. And so we have Christopher Columbus here on, on the side here as the demon, and then also, uh, the uh, what do you call it? the mountain range here? <laughs> Sorry, it totally slips my mind. <clears throat> but um, but you get the picture. And uh, also with that, the um, the boarding school issue that recently happened, where they found the uh, the remains, the uh, the mass graves of students there, the indigenous students there. You know, uh, with that, you know, I I, I just once I heard of the news, you know, I just, I just I had this idea that just shot in my head or, or this vision that shot in my head of the, these mass graves and, you know, these students that were at these boarding schools and uh, just, you know, broke my heart. So, you know, I, this is more of like a response piece to that news, which is something we as Native Americans, we all kind of knew already, but now the evidence was there. And so um, still playing with paints, you know, uh, this is all paint, digital work paint and um Playing with the, uh, like I said, I always like the darker side of things. I like those scary stories that a lot of Native American tribes have. And so this this image is a a, um, a visual representation of a, of a scary story we have here on my reservation about a, a man who was half horse and half man. I'm sorry, but uh, for the sake of time, I'm, I'm just moving it along here. And um, a more fun piece is this digital work of a saguaro cactus house and kind of playing more with fantasy, but also still having these um, these cultural meanings here and there. Uh, I, I had this idea of how I would, um, what about, you know, I always thought tree houses were cool, you know, the the houses, the tree houses, but uh, you know, I was thinking how, how, how would a cactus, a saguaro cactus tree house look? And so then that, my mind just went crazy and I started to play, play around with my, knowledge of uh, perspective you know two-point perspective and then this this uh painting came to be and uh starting to experiment again i always recommend my students to experiment i started to experiment with customizing painting shoes but not just with acrylic but with actual uh paint that is meant to customize shoes and so keeping that uh awesome aesthetic i i started using my water designs in the shoes and also my uh, also using color theory to make make these shoes work. So I use a brand called Angelus Paint, and the, the Angelus Paint allows the shoe to be wearable even after painting. So uh, uh, something I'm still exploring. I'm still doing more of it. But uh, you know, I I did do a couple for uh, an exhibition coming up, and so I think that um, I just had a blast with the process. This process is kind of crazy. It's, it's time consuming, but it's. Um, I just I just love the whole process of it. You know, I'm not, I'm not I wasn't too concerned about the outcome. I was more I was more interested in the process, but the outcome is secondary when it came to painting these shoes. So uh, I'm still gonna do more of those. I haven't done too many of them. And my latest project was the Evans Churchill Substation project in uh, Roosevelt Row in Phoenix, Arizona. And so the uh, Roosevelt Row, they're having a new APS substation built, and uh, they had this call for artists where we all had to submit. Uh, a um, application and um, went through this whole uh, process of getting chosen. I believe it was something like um, eight out of 60 something artists were uh, were chosen. So uh, luckily I was one of the eight, you know, my my work stood out and I got chosen to, to do one of the walls here on the uh, Evan Churchill substation project. So I have a photo of me there uh, in working attire and then uh, a completed picture on the right of the uh, mural. Uh, but also I like to include uh, the drafting I did for the, the project. So these are just the um, preliminary drafts of the ideas I had for the wall. And so the, the left-hand side is of course the, the one I went with, 
but the right hand side is of the uh, my first idea of how I wanted the uh, the structures to be stacked. And so the idea was the um, location Roosevelt Row, Phoenix, Arizona. I wanted to again, I wanted to stress that you know there the Huagum were here first, then the Autumn, and then after that everyone else came. So I did that through the uh, the structures, the houses that that were built on. So the first one is the uh, Huagum uh, Pit House. And then the second one is the uh, Optum Otis Key. And then we have the California Bungalow. And then, of course, the APS substation, which is more of a uh, modern structure. But I did uh, switch out the APS substation with the, uh, I don't know if you can see it, but it's a, um, a uh, apartment building, which is kind of how we, how we live nowadays anyways. So uh, kind of going through that, maybe a, a history, a timeline of uh, structures in the area to be painted on the wall. So that's pretty much how that went. And uh, I believe we're up, we're up at our time. So uh, thank you. And there's my Facebook information, Instagram and my email. So uh, I also have a website called www.dwaynemanor.com. So please check it out. And I thank you for sticking around through my spiel. And I am now complete just on time at 12 o'clock. Well, thank you so much, Dwayne. That was a fantastic presentation. And um, just to let our audience know, we will have a link to Dwayne's website within the follow-up email that will have the recording of this program. And so you mentioned a, an exhibit that you'll have coming up soon. So do you have any current exhibits? And can you tell us about your upcoming exhibit? Yeah, I have... Um... Well, uh, that one, actually, I'm, I'm still waiting. It's supposed to be in uh, Flagstaff, I believe. So uh, I'm trying to figure out, or I'm trying, I'm waiting on what the word is. But uh, I have a couple of projects coming up. And I'm not sure if I could talk about them just yet. But um, yeah, that's, that's all the information I have right now when it comes to that. No problem. And you may have touched on this um, when you were uh, talking about the, the basket designs. But... Was it your teacher's um, uh, encouragement to use traditional background um, or a natural evolution uh, through your thinking about the history of your tribe? It was definitely a natural uh, evolution uh, because those basket designs were, uh, like I was saying, it was kind of something I was doing on the side. It was, it was more for me to figure out what I wanted, try to figure out a fresher way of, you know, using my people's artwork and then pushing it to the next level. So it was something I was kind of, kind of molding so the, yeah the, no, no, no instructors really had no uh, say in that actually a lot of them didn't know what I was doing them until I, I showed them like hey you know I'm, I'm working on this let me know what you think and they're like wow you know how come you're not doing stuff like this I was like oh, I don't know I don't want to and did you have access to art education in your elementary schooling or was it really in your um, uh, post high school or that you were exposed to our education? It was probably post high school. We had, uh, like in high school, we had, we didn't really have an art class. We had uh, an area for people to hang out and we had a teacher sit in there, you know, hang out with us because uh, we didn't really have an art teacher. We Maybe a couple times we did, but uh, we really had no formal education. It was just kind of this place for it to hang out uh, with the, you know, the kids who didn't want to do anything else. So we just, me and my friends would just draw in class anyway. So. It was uh, no real formal art education. Maybe earlier in the years, you know, as, as like like first grade or something, but um, not that I can recall really. It was all afterwards, uh, after high school for me, where I started to uh, be educated in art. And a question about your website is, do you have pieces currently for sale on your website? Uh, not right now. I do have an online store. Yeah, but that's primarily like uh, like merchandise, like stickers and things like that. But uh, the not not on the website. The, my website is primarily for um, um, just showing the artwork. Uh, what's the word again? Uh, <laughs> portfolio, portfolio purposes. But I do have an online store. Uh, it is a uh, Dwayne Manual at Big Cartel. And regarding your digital art, have you entered the NTF world? Oh no! I, I, I get I get that a lot. I, I, people ask me that a lot, and um, it's something I really don't know too much about. Even after doing a little bit of research and reading about it, I still don't understand understand it personally. And uh, I do people ask people ask me about it. I, can, I but right now it's kind of it's kind of uh, above my head, and I can't uh, I can't wrap my ha head around it just yet. So uh, I don't know. We'll see. I guess the proper 
opportunity lands on my lap, then definitely, but not right now. And <clears throat> I do have one comment that you will be at the Pueblo Grande Indian Market as a featured artist and to definitely go uh, over to the Pueblo Grande Indian Market on December 10th and 11th in Phoenix at 44th Street in Washington. Yes, that's the one. That's the one I, uh, I didn't know if I was able to talk about just yet. But yeah, I'll, uh, I'll be there at the Pueblo Grande Market and um, I'm sure you'll be able to find me. I think, yeah. And last question. So do you do your murals for, uh, at, on a commission basis? Yeah, definitely commission basis, uh, the murals. Uh, that's, that's pretty much how it went. You know, uh, my earlier days, I was definitely doing, um, I guess you would call it a uh, volunteer work just to get my portfolio up. But you know, it, it kind of, since then, it probably, it's just, it's just, it's just snowballed. And you know, things started getting better. Uh, more opportunities started coming and I had to start um, thinking more about uh, the business side of the artwork. So, you know, uh, that's because that's how it goes. You know, I get a lot of questions about, about business and pricing stuff and all like, you know, I remember the days where I didn't know nothing about it, but you know, I, you know, it's pretty much trial and error. So, you know, I find myself nowadays that it's pretty much all um, commission with the murals. I know I had said that was the last question, but this one is good. So I, <laughs> I want to ask you this one. <laughs> um, does your mom give input or critique on your designs that incorporate the basket patterns? Uh, she, she gives feedback, input sometimes, uh, but not really. She, you know, I guess she's a mother. She likes everything I do. So she's not really going to say uh, too much. I do remember a time she did tell me that one, she didn't like one basket design uh, painting because it was too Christmassy because I, you know, because I use a lot of color theory in my uh, painting. So, you know, uh, the, the uh, complementary color of uh, red and, is green. So I was using that as, as a color combo and she just told me it looked too Christmassy. <laughs> so that, that was, that's why the one I could think about that she ever gave me some, uh, I guess, I guess if you would call that negative feedback, but to me, it was kind of funny. Oh, moms can always give you honest feedback. That's, <laughs> that's wonderful. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dwayne, for joining us today. It was a, a truly a treat to see your extraordinary work. And um, also, thank you for sharing your time with our audience. Of course, no problem. It was a pleasure. And uh, yeah, I had to speed it up at the end, but, uh, you know, I, I didn't realize I was, you know, running out of time. But cool. I'm, I'm thankful. I'm thankful you all are here and I'm thankful for the invite. And uh, yeah, check out my website and uh, my, my Facebook if you ever have any more questions, anybody out there. And thanks again. And thank you to our audience for joining us. And again, uh, Dwayne will be at the Pueblo Grande Indian Market as a featured artist on December 10th and 11th in Phoenix. Um, you can find that at 44th Street in Washington. And until then, we hope to see you, uh, our audience, on July 9th for our next Amaranth Online Program. Thank you, everyone. Bye.